Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find all the old shows described by RSS, and there's also a direct link to iTunes there. Also, again, I have Jeff Squire from Cisco Systems and OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time helping out with this. Hey, Brock, this is always cool stuff. I love to... Uh, come and talk to the various people here and find out new and interesting things that I didn't know before. So it's always an educational experience for me. And I even get to write about this on the on my blog sometimes there. Um, Because did did you like how I I snuck that in there? The marketing overlords like me to to mention my blog on here. So I have to find a way to mention it every time. (laughs) No problem. This package that we're going to talk about today, I found out about from a friend of mine who's using it not on the system I'm administrator for, but then after we set up the interview, but before this recording, I had a user request it. So I've recently gone through the building of this package, which is a gigantic, very versatile package. But I'll let our guests uh, describe that. So our two guests today are Mike Haru and Jim Willenbring, and they are both at Sandia National Lab. But guys, why don't you go ahead and take a moment to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Mike Haru. Uh, Worked, I've worked for Sandia uh, since uh, May of 1998. Prior to that, I uh, was at Cray Research, so I've been in HPC for a long time. Um, I, I and also Jim will find out to actually telecommute for Sandia. We both live in uh, rural central Minnesota, and I uh, have worked at Sandia and also teach part-time. I'm a scientist in residence at uh, St. John's University here uh, in central Minnesota. I'm Jim Willenbring. I've worked on the project for nine years. I'm part of most of what happens in Trilinos that isn't specific to a Trilinos package. For example, the build system, testing infrastructure, general planning of, for the project. My official role is the framework and tools capability area leader. So the package we're talking about is Trilinos. Uh, so could you, one of you guys explain to us exactly what Trilinos is? Yeah, this is Mike. I'll get started. Uh, so Trilinos is, is several things, um, and depending on who you are, you care more about one aspect of it or another. Uh, first and foremost, it's actually a, a fairly large collection of independently developed packages. Uh, each package is uh, developed by a small team of people, typically you know, two to five you know, maybe, maybe seven at most, uh, and each package is focused on one particular set of capabilities that are needed by people who are doing computational science and engineering or other technical computing areas. For example, solvers is, is our heritage, but we do much more now. So it's this collection of libraries. It's also the framework that uh, Jim mentioned that he manages and uh, keeps track of that allows all of these packages to coexist not step over each other and build together, and a collection of tools that make the development and software engineering processes easier. And then third, and maybe as important as the other two is, or maybe more so, is it's a community. It's a community of people with uh, like interests and goals uh, that meets on a regular basis, talks with each other, uh, rubs elbows and shares and, and argues and and cajoles and everything together uh, as we try to provide this huge body of of software to uh, the scientific and engineering and technical computing communities. Okay, so I've been for a number of months now calling it Trilinos, but I guess that's not actually the correct way it's pronounced. How is the package actually pronounced? Uh, we tend to say Trilinos, but certainly there are others who pronounce it as you do, uh, and, and, and it's okay to be bilingual. Okay, so now I've got the free pass because I'm gonna. It's gonna take me a while to get it beat into my thick skull that the right way to say it. So where does that name come from? What is that derived from? Uh, it, it, so I, I arrived at Sandia in '98, and and there's this uh, heritage of naming projects by Southwest names, Chaco, Jemez, Sierra things like that, and, and that namespace was used up, and I started thinking, well, what's another language that has interesting terminology? And I thought, well, Greek is pretty good. 
And so I started looking for Greek words, and, and here was this picture of a three-stranded string of pearls. And I thought, that's beautiful. You know, I, had this, I had this notion that we wanted to do individual packages and have that put together in some kind of meta framework. And so that image has always been part of the project. And so trilinos comes from this notion of a string of pearls. Uh, the tri in trilinos was actually our grand vision of three packages. And, and so we thought we were going to do three, and now we're up to, I think, roughly 57 or so. But that's where the name comes from. And, and you'll see that there's this Greek naming theme, not, not completely, but uh, throughout the project. And so there, will be, there are a bunch of packages in the project, uh, many of them which are uh, less pronounceable than trilinos or trilinos, if you will. That has got to be the best thought out rationale from a name that I have ever heard <laughs> that is that is fantastic <laughs> so give us a little more of the history right so you you started this project up and you had this grand vision of uh three packages what were what were the original three packages i mean what was the scope back then right. and, and how has it evolved right uh data classes which eventually evolved into what we call the e-petra package uh linear solvers uh, preconditioned iterative methods, which became the uh, Aztec O, O, and IFPAC, it split into those packages, and then nonlinear solvers, which uh, evolved into being a package we call NOCT. So, that, so, so it, 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 those are the three basic capabilities we thought of. It, the, the whole project um, uh, it, it grew out of uh, several impeding needs. One is we had lots of algorithms developers who were given funding to develop new capabilities. That, that on one hand. On the other hand, we had uh, some very, uh, what seemed to be onerous software quality engineering requirements coming down to us from uh, the Department of Energy offices them telling us that you, there are certain processes and practices and, and, and assurances you have to make about the quality of your software. And so on the one hand, we had small teams. On the other hand, we had big demands. And so the idea was, how about if we create a kind of a federation of algorithm development teams to, and then together we can come up with policies and tools that address this big problem that no small team alone can handle. And, and so really that was the, the, the kind of the uh, pot uh, that put uh, this all together. So I noticed when I was building Trilinos and I was trying to build every um, sub package that I could, uh, the source code was almost 100 megabytes. And when built with all the object files around, it took about 14 gig. This is a huge package. So how many people are involved with this project, and how do you delegate who's responsible for different packages? That's a good question. So, so each package team has a package leader. That person is responsible. Remember, I said there are about 57 packages. So each package team has a package leader. In addition, we have eight what we call capability area leaders who are responsible for being proactive in a particular area. For example, uh, linear solvers would be one, or meshing geometry. And then on the top is uh, me, uh, Mike Haru, Haru as, uh, as kind of the nominal overall project leader. So what would you say one of the primary uses of Trilinos is? Um, do, you want, do you guys only work on the... the individual packages or are you actually users of it in a higher level manner and you contribute back yeah we yeah we're, we are all users of each other's capabilities uh, one, we have a set of strategic goals one of them is is that if it makes mathematical sense for one package to use another then we create that uh, ability for one package to use the other. So yes, we are our own users in addition to being developers. Uh, we have uh, uh, literally thousands of users throughout the world in addition to being you know, the primary uh, deliverer of capabilities in libraries for, for Sandia and now a growing presence at uh, the other national laboratories in the U.S. And many so, of the developers. Go, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to ask the next question, but if you've got more, go right ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to add, many Trilinos developers are also 
users via other projects that they work on in addition to using other packages within Trilino. So there's a lot of uh, higher level knowledge that comes back down into the implementation of the various packages and, and deep knowledge of the requirements for the capabilities. So all these different packages in, in Trilino, how are they, are they related to each other? I mean, do they share common interfaces like one package? Well, let's say I have two or three different packages. They're all different implementations of the same interface, or are they just related through the build system and they just provide different capabilities for different users? Or well, what is the relationship between these? Well, there are kind of, there's, a, okay, I'll, I'll take this one. In a way, there's almost an, an old Trilinos and a, and a new Trilinos. And, and then there's packages that don't quite fit into that mold. But many existing Trilinos packages are based on the ePetra object model. So th they understand what an ePetra matrix is or an ePetra vector is, and, and it uses that common interface. And as long as, as long as your package can understand the ePetra object model, it can make use of various solvers and preconditioners and other tools. Now, the, the newer Trilinos, uh, ePetra is a package that does computations only in double precision. There's, a, there's also a tPetra object model that's a templated version. And, and this is kind of the, as I said, the, the newer Trilinos, and there's a host of packages built in much the same way on top of that. But then there are also a few packages that, that maybe don't use these models natively, but perhaps can understand them. But that's a primary method of interoperability, I'd say. So you're referring to objects a lot. I take it Trilinos is built in uh, C++ or Python or some sort of object-oriented language? The yeah, majority of it. Yeah, the majority of it. Yeah, we, we certainly uh, uh, tend to use object-oriented principles, uh, and, and C++ is, is the dominant programming language. But there's also some C, and uh, we've actually aggressively started adopting uh, uh, Fortran object-oriented capabilities in a package called Fortrilinos. So what is the breakdown of your users? Um, so it, it, in the MPI community, mostly what I hear is, uh, oh, yes, the scientists and the engineers and the, the you know, not natively computer people per se uh, prefer Fortran because Fortran as a language is, is absolutely fabulous at, at what it does. It does numerical computations uh, very, very well. Um, but, uh, you know, from what you're saying that you're actually going after the, the OO kinds of languages, the C++, which at least in my world, I wouldn't natively assume, uh, associate with scientific com computation and, uh, also the object oriented features of, of newer modern Fortran and stuff. So are you seeing big uptakes of that in the user community? Well, uh, so it depends on which user community you're in. Uh, in the engineering community, and Sandia, its heritage of it is engineering. So there's almost no Fortran used in the applications at Sandia. And, and so it's very natural for us if we're servicing the, the needs of the, the Sandia community to use C++. Um, even, even outside of that, there's a growing community of applications that are not written in Fortran. And, uh, and even if you are a Fortran application, most applications are able to uh, interact with C++ in a meaningful way that's not too difficult for them. So, so I, I think it's, it, it works pretty well. Certainly, I think uh, there, there's an uptake issue uh, with, in certain application areas. So, uh, you know, but over time, and I think actually the, the migration to many core based uh, GPU, CPU type of nodes is going to accelerate uh, this change. So what about the argument of any type of trade-off between performance and being really low level and ease of programming and abstraction using object models? W was this a discussion when deciding what Trilinos and, and the architecture of Trilinos was going to be? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, and and we have, uh, if you look carefully at the design of Trilinos, we have a, a hierarchy of interfaces. And 
you know, the very lowest levels are where you have the maximal control over performance impacting aspects of software design and use. And then you can increase, you know, go up to more and more abstract levels. And you don't lose a whole lot, but what you lose is maybe some control over the path taken through the software. And so this multi-level approach really allows you to pick the level of abstraction that you want uh, in, in the use of what Trilinos provides. So there's a, another well-known package coming out of the National Labs uh, that, at least from my high-level sysadmin, please build this for a user perspective. Uh, Petsy, what is the relationship between you guys and Petsy? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Petsy predates Trilinos, and, and in fact, um, you know, when we started the, the Trilinos project, even before it was Trilinos. Uh, there were people at Sandia using Petsy. Uh, there were people using another package called Aztec, which pre was a precursor and now is actually one small portion of Trilinos. And so we are certainly aware of Petsy. Uh, Petsy provides a lot of good capabilities. It's a highly regarded collection of libraries. Uh, their focus has been uh, uh, purposefully on PDEs. And so they do PDEs very well, both uh, structured and unstructured linear and nonlinear solvers, and, and, uh, and so it has a nice following, in, uh, particularly in the Fortran and the science community. Uh, it, it has a focus on being a homogeneous collection of software capabilities. Even if they're pulling something in from the outside, they will integrate it into Petsy, and, and so building it isn't uh, a, a challenge. Uh, Trilinos has taken a different approach and, and, and trying to provide a community environment uh, for uh, people to come in and make their contributions in forms of these packages. And so uh, two things have happened. One is on the edges between packages, there's some interesting dynamic stuff that goes on and it can be a challenge to build pieces of Trilinos because of this. On the other hand, because we have this loose con uh, confederation of people, uh, we've been able to grow the project very quickly and provide capabilities that we just couldn't do if we were trying to have a more centralized control over things. So Petsy, uh, as the capabilities of Petsy are very good, uh, really focused on PDEs. Uh, I tend to tell people if Petsy has what you need, it's probably going to be easier for you to use that. But if you think that you're going to grow outside of what Petsy provides, you might think about using Trilinos. Or if you already need some of the things that we provide that Petsy doesn't provide, then you should consider using Trilinos. So I noticed when building Trilinos that there was actually an option to tell Trilinos where your Petsy install was. Are you actually adding your own abstraction layer, or will Trilinos use Petsy for certain functions? We have our own abstraction layer, and we uh, we have made a commitment to that if you're an existing Petsy user and you've committed to using Petsy's data classes, then you should have access to what Trilinos provides because all of our solvers and preconditioners uh, access uh, matrix and vector data via abstraction layers. And so we can certainly wrap Petsy's data structures and you have access to everything that Trilinos provides. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a nice thing that we, we also do that with another popular package called Hyper uh, that provides scalable preconditioners. And so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. We're all good friends with each other and are trying to leverage each other's capabilities as best we can. Petsy also wraps uh, several of Trilinos capabilities, in particular ML, and they provide access to some of the uh, Zoltan capabilities, each of these as packages in Trilino. So let me ask this uh, in terms of, of, of my home court and, and bias and whatnot. How many of your packages are, are paralyzed versus how many of them are, are serial? And in particular, do they, do they use MPI or OpenMP or what, what parallel abstractions do they use? Yeah, good question. So all of the packages uh, that make sense to run with MPI uh, are enabled to use MPI. We actually don't have uh, explicit calls to MPI except in one class that is a parallel abstraction, an implementation of our parallel machine interface that uses MPI. So, so we have, you know, using object-oriented principles, we've isolated MPI uh, specific uh, dependencies to one data class. And of course, our examples and 
you know, other programs need to use it. So MPI is heavily used. We also support OpenMP in the ePetra package, and we are heavily involved in development for uh, data classes and algorithms that use CUDA, uh, Thrust, which is a layer that sits on top of CUDA, threading building blocks from Intel, uh, 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 and uh, you know, certainly pthreads, and other types of parallel programming uh, environments. So if you built an MPI abstraction class to use everywhere else, does that cause any difficulty trying to, uh, say I have an existing application and I want to use a solver and Trilinos has it, and so how hard is it to kind of bring Trilinos into an existing traditional C or Fortran or C++ that's directly calling MPI? It's, it's very easy. We, In fact, uh, how you construct our we call it ePetraCom, and there's equivalent one called tPetraCom. How you build one of our COM objects is you pass in your communicator, your MPI communicator, and then we access the parallel machine through your communicator. Okay, so then related to that, say I wanted to use all of your lower level building blocks of Trilinos and basically make my own custom package. How difficult is it to just kind of start creating my own add-on to Trilinos. <laughs> we, we, we've put a lot of effort into making it easy, but but that doesn't necessarily mean you know your mileage may vary. Um, I, I really don't think it's that hard. I think it's much easier than than building up your your own software stack because you you just have to implement that that interface. Uh, if you, if you have an enormous piece of software existing, then then that's you know going to take a little bit of work to put it. In integrate the ePetra or tPetra object model into that. But the intent here is that you're providing all this infrastructure so that uh, random Joe physicist or mathematician or whatever can, you know, just focus on their solver code and the rest of the stuff is kind of handled by magic, right, by the rest of the infrastructure and things that you're providing. And, you know, kind of going back to what you said earlier, that there's all these really strong demands coming down from uh, you know management saying you need to have very high quality software, but that's kind of beyond the average uh, developer. They want to just do their thing that their expertise in, and then all the rest of the infrastructure just kind of provides the rest of those high level guarantees. Is that kind of the rationale here? Yeah, it is. I mean, the overall design principle that that we uh, adhere to is uh, don't repeat yourself. Right? We like to make. If there's a, a, a capability that exists within what we provide, you should be able to easily tap into that and build on top of that, adding the delta that is your unique specialty, your, 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 your unique need, and then leverage everything else that's available. And, and you know, part of the beauty of, of object-oriented programming and you know, ab abstractions and inheritance is that it's fairly easy to do that in software. And depending on the level that you want to add to within Trilinos, if you want to add a new solver or something like that, you can actually leverage the Trilinos build system and and make it look like a Trilinos package fairly easily. And then you could just install your package and library along with all the other libraries. If, if you're building strictly on top of Trilinos with an application, then you can just install Trilinos and use it. But but there's a interoperability to allow people to add capabilities and, and really whole new packages into Trilinos pretty seamlessly. So going kind of along that and also going back earlier in the conversation, you said community is very important. How does your community function? How do you have all these independent teams together, you know, and, and get the team leads together and say, all right, it's time to make a release and who makes decisions about where the interface goes and, all that kind of stuff. How do you guys function? Well, we're a fairly distributed team. Certainly the, the bulk of, of participants are in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Sandia's uh, main site. But we also have a number who are at uh, in Sandia in California, in Livermore area. And we have uh, myself and Jim who are in Minnesota and, and people at various other labs and universities. So we're we're distributed. A lot of our com communication occurs via mail lists. Uh, we we're, we heavily use those. We're migrating to you know more interactive uh, wiki types of setups, but that takes some time to do. Uh, if nothing else, for security policies and issues related to that. 
Uh, we also have an annual uh, Trilinos user group meeting that has a developer day associated with it. So we meet face to face on that day. That's usually right around the first part of November. And then we also have a spring developer day that occurs uh, in April or May, uh, depending on schedules. Uh, and then we also have monthly uh, leaders meetings uh, for the team. Uh, we have an advisory group uh, that involves uh, the uh, external advisors. And then we also have a board, what we call a capability leader, these eight people. And we meet fairly regularly, again, by phone. So there are all these uh, opportunities for exchange of information that will occur. Uh, and, and there are many heated uh, and passionate discussions that occur on the mail list or by phone. And, and that's where a lot of the uh, kind of uh, community aspects come out, where, where we negotiate for good ideas. I think the biggest thing that we bring to the table in this community spirit is, is a meritocracy. It, it, there's nobody who's in charge of the project because you know, they're, they're, they were imposed by management. Uh, it's really all about who has the best idea, and the best idea gets to win. And, he, and we're going to work to solve an issue until the best idea uh, emerges, and then go with it. So I'm curious, who exactly is using Trilinos? Of course, you guys at the labs are using it. But what are some commonly known packages that people may be familiar with that are currently using Trilinos? Um, so our user base uh, is is very broad. Uh, some of them we, we can't really say who they are. Uh, probably you can understand why. But uh, I'll, I'll give you a few examples. So so the climate community has actually started to adopt Trilinos uh, in a fairly serious way, uh, both in across several different air components of the uh, uh, community or systems model project in the atmospheric area, uh, ocean modeling, uh, sea ice, uh, ice sheet modeling. Uh, all of these are, are components in the community climate system model. And they all have been charged with doing uh, what are called multi-decadal sim simulations. Uh, they're explicit by nature or semi-implicit. And so time steps uh, are a serious bottleneck. They, can, they, can't, they can only take so big a time step. And so they have to uh, uh, transform their formulations to what are called implicit approaches that allow much larger time steps so that you can go out multiple decades much more quickly than if you have to take these tiny time steps. And so we've been involved quite a bit in the uh, climate community with development of solvers and integration of solvers into those codes. Uh, we're also quite involved in the nuclear engineering community. Uh, there are several large projects uh, that have started up recently. Uh, there's a project called CASTLE, which is uh, intended to extend the life span of, of uh, uh, nuclear reactors that exist in the United States and, and others, but I'll stop for a moment. That's funny. My training is actually in nuclear engineering, and that's how I found out about Trilinos was a guest talk, and their package was built on top of Trilinos. Yeah. So then what kind of scalability for the MPI portions? I assume every package is a little different, but what kind of scalability are we reaching with Trilinos? Yeah, so, so most of the packages obtain their scalability as long as the algorithm itself is scalable. Uh, via our underlying data classes. And so the scalability is actually very good. Uh, Trilinos has uh, run to, on the full scale of Jaguar PF, which is the largest general purpose machine on the planet right now. Uh, we haven't run on the Chinese Tianhu uh, One system that's GPU based, but we actually could. We have the uh, infrastructure in place to run on that kind of machine. So. Yeah. The biggest limitation we many of our users face right now is that a number of our uh, production quality packages that are very robust, uh, well understood, are limited in the size of problem they can solve because their integer size is 32-bit. And so that limits the size of problem that they can solve to plus or minus 2 billion. Uh, we, have, we have new capabilities, this T-Petra package stack that uh, Jim mentioned earlier, uh, is gets rid of that limitation. You can have an arbitrarily large problem. 
but but there are some people who are production oriented built on the older packages and that's actually the biggest limitation to scalability all right, so as a, a fellow software developer, I, I always like to ask uh, you know, some questions about the code base and the management and things like that uh, of other projects, just out of genuine curiosity, because sometimes there's genuine passion in uh, some of the decisions that are made. Some people don't really care, but some people have very, very firm reasons for, for doing so. So looking on your website, I see that uh, Trilino's 10.0 switched from the GNU Auto Tools to CMake, and uh, I was just curious as to if you could tell me a little bit about why. Well, we had several reasons for switching, actually, and the decision was was carefully thought out. A paper was written about it, and it was discussed for well over a year, I think. Uh, but the the strongest drivers, one was uh, improving Microsoft Windows support, and and specifically being able to build Trilinos outside of Sigwin. Uh, another significant reason was to improve dependency tracking. The auto tools really had problems figuring out exactly what needed to be recompiled after changes were made to the code. And um, sometimes seemed to compile too much and sometimes not enough and that, that really caused problems. And if you're building all of Trilinos and if you're working on one of these low level packages like ePetra, you really need to recompile everything before you commit to the repository. It, it really got to be a mess with the dependency tracking of the auto tools. Uh, another was improved shared library support. We had kind of hacked uh, shared library support into our auto tools system. And there's just a little less maintenance. It's a little easier to add an additional package, uh, few, fewer lines of code to, to take care of overall, I think. Uh, also, the, the C test and C dash that come that you can use with CMake very seamlessly. The, the testing and then also the the dashboard where you can display nightly test results and such. That was a big win for us because we had our own homegrown system, and it it had some nice it had some nice features, but it had some pretty severe limitations. Now we can do things like uh, have test timeouts, make sure an individual test doesn't run too long, make sure a build doesn't run too long, make sure that um, d builds in successive days don't um, stomp on one another if it, if it runs an entire day. Cool. Those are all very good reasons, very well thought out. Uh, let me ask you this. Also, what is your uh, source code repository technology of choice and why? We, we actually we used to use CVS. And we've moved now to Git in the last couple of years. And and the the reason for the switch was that CVS isn't um, it isn't very efficient when the code base gets really large. CVS certainly has some nice features, but but now with Git we can do lots of great things. You can um, collaborate with people much more easily. You can check things into you know separate branches and work with a small number of people without making without making your changes public and then bring those back um, you, you can have gatekeeper situations if if you want to much more easily with with git than cvs there, there were a number of reasons there as well so what kind of license is trilinos under it's mostly licensed lgpl we're Migrating toward a, a BSD license. So, so just to decode that, LGPL is the GNU Lesser General Public License, which is an appropriate license for embedded software, where you know the, it, it has a copy lefting mechanism, where if you if you make changes to Trulino's code proper, you're obligated to make those changes available back to the uh, open source community. But if you embed Trulinos in an, in an application without making modifications, then that's okay. You don't have to make your application open source. Uh, we're moving to BSD uh, strategically because we're finding that some of our industrial partners uh, and and uh, vendors now who support Trulinos, for example, uh, Cray provides Trilinos as part of their scientific libraries offering. They, they pre-compile it for their XT series of machines, and they provide a little value added by uh, boosting the performance of some key uh, kernels. 
uh, we find that our the, these people and industrial partners are you know major companies in the U.S. that are using Trulinos for as part of their software foundation are, are very uncomfortable with the copy lefting aspects of LGPL, where 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 BSD doesn't have anything like that, and so we're moving to we're moving over time to BSD, and we're going to move all of it as much as possible. There are some hairy edges where that's hard to BSD because we get far more value out of these collaborations than we do out of out of the principle of you know, re maintaining op uh, open source. So what exactly, maybe you could clarify a little bit uh, about, you know, since I come from one of these large companies who tend to prefer BSD type style open source licenses, what do you mean by migrating to? Uh, is there paper or legal paper? work and yeah, things that are you're trying to get all proper or, or what does that mean well so so when you go in so we're doing it package by package again a great again a great uh, these packages are modular pieces of software it's a great management tool for lots of things and one of them is migration of licensing policies so little by little we're going through and taking each package and we're and we're declaring you are now a BSD package not an LGPL package and so that's what I mean uh, by migrating to L to uh, BSD. Uh, and, and yes, it's paperwork, and and we can't just say we want to switch from an LGPL license to a BSD license. There's there there's more legwork associated with the move than simply changing our mind. The other thing we're doing at the same time is we're we need to recognize that. There are, there are community members who want to make contributions to Trulinos and that who don't want to give up their, their uh, ability to assert copyright. And so we're moving to a model that will allow external uh, institutions to put their copyright into the source code that they contribute to Trulinos as long as they also agree to licensing it under the BSD approach. So I want to back up a little bit and ask a different question that I'll splice in. So so what's coming in future versions of Trilinos? What do you guys plan to do? Lots. It, as I said, it's a community. And so the, you know, each member of this community has their own set of strategic goals and, and a, ambitious activities that you know, they're trying to, to lead the community in their particular area of algorithms and software for scientific computing. So we have leading edge efforts in Everything from data classes for you know scalable many core systems, algorithms for scalable many core systems, to the the latest in uh, uh, linear solvers, you know uh, block iterative methods, recycling methods, so-called communication avoiding methods, the the best in nonlinear uh, solvers. Uh, now we're moving towards uh, optimization, embedded optimization, uncertainty quantification. Uh, uh, you know, stochastic PDEs and, and you know, scalable meshing and all of these different capabilities. And because of this community model, we can grow simultaneously in lots of different directions. Uh, you know, the, our, if, you, if I could say our ultimate goal is to provide a solution that's high fidelity to a particular problem of interest with error bars. So we can, so the goal is not just to provide an answer but to also give you a sense of confidence in that answer. So what's perhaps the, the strangest use that you've ever heard of, Trilino? Something that you, you really didn't intend, uh, but you, you hear that somebody's using your pro project say, wow, okay, I, I wouldn't have thought of that. Well, Jim, you had one. Well, m m mine, mine is really more of a more of a fun use. Maybe it wasn't intended either, but um, professional racing teams use Trulinos for their um, design, so, so, designing so, so, their vehicles right. and so, such. Yeah, so a particular uh, Formula One race team that we won't mention has, has heavily used Trulinos to uh, improve the design of their uh, vehicles. Uh, other uses I know of, uh, uh, digital dentistry. Uh, we had a download and, and uh, uh, from a company whose sole purpose is to uh, provide uh, digital capabilities in the dentist office, uh, and and, uh, and so that's very interesting. Also, uh, we've been getting into areas people who are doing medical imaging, 
uh, who try to de-blur images, not, not in some kind of big computing facility, but right in the clinic. And so all of these uh, many core capabilities for you know, GPUs and CPUs that we're developing make possible, you know, you can cart in a Dell workstation with a GPU and you can do things in the clinic uh, in terms of modeling and simulation and, and uh, improving the quality of the, of the uh, diagnostic devices that physicians are using uh, by using Trilinos. So what's the website for Trilinos? Uh, so Trilinos is available uh, from trilinos.sandia.gov. That is the main portal to the project. Uh, everybody who gains access to it you typically starts right from that page, including the developers. Uh, it, and uh, if there are things that you uh, don't like about the website or you want to see changed, uh, we're always open to try to improve it. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your time, and this will be out soon. Okay, thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. All right, thanks. All right.